Good evening and welcome to Heritage Baptist Church. We're going to sing out a little, little skinny songbooks that's in front of you. And uh, we're going to sing number 10, uh, first and third verse. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for what a great God that you are, Lord, and all the many, many things that we have to rejoice, Lord, as Christians, as child of God, Lord. And Lord, help us to remember them, Lord, and to, to share that joy with the world, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be uh, the lights of the world, your light shining through us, Lord. And uh, pray that, Lord, that we can um, go about with good hearts, good attitudes, Lord, and help us, Lord, to love one another. And Lord, I love you, and I pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we're glad that you're with us, too. We, next Saturday is a big day for us. you have got all kinds of stuff going on. Even if you're not a part of the classes, and you're not, go ahead and come up and help. We've got lots of things to do. We need present wrappers and people helpers and costume adjusters and anything else that you want to do like that to, make, to get it ready. We have the kids, junior kids have their country store, Christmas store, and then we have play practice, and then tomorrow night, uh, that's, that night we have their adult class birth, uh, Christmas party, the birthday party for Jesus. We're going to come up and have fun with that. We, we want you to be here for part of that. The teens have theirs on the 22nd, and uh, we're going to, they, they wanted barbecue, uh, no, they wanted brisket preacher, a pizza, brisket pizza, and so what? Uh, you know where you got to find brisket pizza at in this town? It's not easy, okay, but they get up far enough on the north side, you can get brisket pizza. And so right up there, we get it together. Maybe you know of a place, but we're working on it. Looking, they got half of them going, no, no, no. Yeah, but that's what they ask for. You always got to give a kid what they want for Christmas, right? Amen. That's what I'm saying. And I, we got a, lots of cool things. Everything stays the same for the New Year's holiday and stuff that's going on. We're not changing church times or anything. And so you'll be a part of that. Do you realize that, that two weeks from the day, Christmas will be open. It is amazing how fast it's moving. And it's, it kind of overtakes us a little bit. It's good to have you here. Pray with me. We're going to pray and ask God to bless. And we, we talked to you about a missionary and a military and uh, uh, all that goes with it. I, my son-in-law retired yesterday with his retirement ceremony. And uh, I, I, he said, I can hardly, and I, I'm going to tell you something. He's not out long enough. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him about three or four months and see because I can hardly wait and I'll have to wear this uniform again. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll wait and see. Uh, usually people like that are like men that say I am never getting married. And they they probably already got a girl in mind and you know they're trying to talk themselves out of it but uh, I'll, I'll let him do a little bit. He's got he's done great things. Deployed time over I don't remember five or six times deployed so he served his country well and so to keep that pray for all the people on our prayer list we're not going to go over that we will on wednesday nights we're not be putting out our wednesday night prayer time so you can get a little more personal we can talk about what needs to be prayed for and just the messages on wednesday night will be going out maybe the special if it's good okay but you know what i mean so if it's not so if they keep asking you to sing on wednesday night you'll know why all right so Actually, I've got a lot of comment. I get, I got, because the preachers have been calling me and they watch the preachers. We, we look at each other's stuff, you know, going, I ain't never doing that. I'm not ever, but whatever. But 
They uh, they like the singing. So that one of them asked me, do you have to be a professional singer to come to your church? I said, no, you don't have to come. You, you, I just, you don't have to be a professional singer. You can come up, but we're, we're privileged to a lot of good music. And we look forward to that, but too. But we're also privileged to have a lot of great men and women. And you probably know a police officer, a fireman, somebody personally, uh, people that you, you understand a lot of those guys are going to be on duty Christmas Day. And so they don't get a choice about rotations. And I guess if they get enough, you know, seniority they got, but most of them, they'll take their regular time. They'll work those days and be going. People in the hospitals and nurses and things like that, they'll be working if it's their time to work in and out. But remember all those people that do all that wonderful stuff for us. And I, I was in the hospital last Friday night and uh, they didn't want to keep me long. Uh, but, uh, uh, they're, they're just overwhelmed. I'm not kidding. And, and they're just totally overwhelmed with the amount of, uh, Cheryl asked them, there was at least a hundred people standing around the walls waiting to get in just the emergency. And she asked us, well, how long has it been like this? And the lady said, what did you say? Two or three, at least two weeks. It's been nonstop. Well, you, you know, uh, that, that wears you down. So you just pray for God's grace and those people who have to work and do that. And they're having to make decisions that they wouldn't want to have to make at other times in their lifetime. So let's pray together and we'll ask God to bless our country. We'll ask him to bless our services. We'll ask him to bless our missionaries and the people that, that help take care of us. Hey, to get back in my house, you know what? We called the fire department and those guys showed up and carried me literally into my house. Because I wasn't about to walk. You could have just rolled me out the, or the car door. I'd have laid right there. I'm telling you. So, uh, but they got in and carried me and, and were so nice and polite. And so we, I, you, you got to appreciate them. You understand that? And they, they probably need to hear you say that every once in a while. So thank you for you, what you do. Father in heaven, we thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is, what he's done in our life and he's done in the life of others. We thank you, Lord, that you were willing to come into a world that did not want you. But you came anyhow. And I'm grateful for those that disagree with us, but understand, even if they disagree, we still care about them. I pray for a lot that I've been praying for, Lord, for years and years who've never been saved. And maybe they never will. But it won't be because we haven't asked God to deal with their hearts and to give them peace in, in their minds and in their lives. But we ask for those in our military and those Lord, that are first responders and the people that are working all those double shifts in the hospitals and different places. Lord, we ask you for grace in their life too. And Lord, I, I know my psychological ability is affected by how little rest I get. And I'm praying for them as they, they're putting their families aside and they're doing things that normal people wouldn't, but they, they've chosen to serve in their capacity. And I pray that you'd bless them. Lord, we ask your blessings on our missionaries around the world, our missionaries of the month. Lord, the special ones that are going to be a part of our services with us. And we ask you, Father, to bless in all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Make sure there's no changes. <laughs> okay, number song number thirteen in the little skinny songbook. Ooh. 
we're going to sing the first and third verse. While by the sheep you watched at night, let night was brought an angel bright. How great our joy, great our joy, 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 joy. we the Lord in heaven on Shall be taught in the stall. This journey we need our soul. All laid out joy, great our joy. Joy, 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 joy. Praise we the Lord in heaven on high. Praise we the Lord in heaven. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, oh hear the angel voices. got your Bible, look with me in the book of first uh, James, book of James. Uh, in the book of James, chapter number one is where we started. That's where I'm going to start tonight because I'm going to remind you uh, yeah, about a, a disciple. 
What is it that a disciple is? What is this a disciple does? A disciple is different than a follower, and a disciple is different than a believer. A believer believes, and you can ask almost anything, but you believe there's a God, you know, probably still 90% of the people in America would say, yeah, I believe there's a God. And the discrepancy over is who their God is. See, there's, that's the big difference. But if you said, you know, do, and this is this is one of the issues years several years ago, uh, I was having my <clears throat> my uh, house carpeted, and and I called, and the carpet guy showed up, and it was a guy that I had known for years, and uh, he showed up, and I'd witnessed to him before, and he was a a real diehard Seventh Day Adventist, and I said, can I help you? And he called him by name. He goes, well, I'm here to lay the carpet. I said, you can't work on Saturday. You'll go to hell. He goes, well, you got to make money. I said, you can tell me that you, you're a believer in that, but you can't tell me you're a follower. Because if you believe that, then you wouldn't be doing the things that broke the Sabbath. If doing Breaking the Sabbath was was what gets you to heaven. And they, I don't know if they still do. They used to teach their people that the sign of the Antichrist that we're, you know, that the Antichrist puts on these people is Sunday church goers. That was the sign. You went to church on Sunday, you're, you're doomed. You know what I mean? And so, but see, there's a difference between a believer. And there's a difference between a follower, somebody that follows that a lot. I mean, y'all follow people on Facebook and stuff. Well, I don't follow them anymore. And so, but there's a great difference. And I'm talking about in Christians, you can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And have him as your personal savior. And you can follow some of the things that he does with your life. And most Christians, that probably 80% of Christianity is in that category, those two things. But when it comes to a disciple, that's a whole different area. In this statistically, statistically, if you look, I, I like to listen to George Barna's statistics about church and churches and people. He's usually pretty much on the money. Uh, the last one he did ended up about, what, four months ago, five months ago, 10,000 churches, 10, thousands and thousands of people that claim to be evangelistic. Seventy percent of the people who say they're Christian now in America believe that you can go to heaven some other way than Christ Jesus as Savior. Okay, they might be a believer, but they're not a follower because Jesus said, you know, but when he said certain things, and we'll go through that, and I did a lot of that last week, so I'm not redoing it. But you're more over and over and over. He's it, a man cannot be my disciple. And then he gave what? Accept. A disciple is somebody who not only believes and somebody that follows, but lives it to the point that he becomes a witness to the master that he's following. And you'll hear that a lot in the world that people who are called a master. Teachers, trainers, especially in the Far East, master, have disciples. And their disciples are like recruiters. They're after try getting other actively trying to get other people to come to know or follow whoever they're after. That's who we are. We're disciples. I don't believe there's any more than 12 apostles. And so we're not we're not apostles. You can say, Well, I believe I'm in a apostolic succession and i'm one of the apostles go with me to the hospital walk from room to room healing everybody and then we'll go to the morgue and you raise the dead and i'll believe you okay but until then my bible says that the 12 foundations of heaven are named after the 12 apostles of the lamb done okay go i want to be a disciple of the lord i don't want to just be a believer i don't want to be a follower I want, to, I want to be a disciple of the Lord. Followers are strange people. You, you say, well, I used to follow them, but I stopped that. See, a lot of Christians were, are that way. We used to follow Jesus, but now we quit. And whatever happened. But I'm telling you this. I want to be a disciple. And we figured out last week that, number one, a disciple endures temptation. And, and what does it take to make you laugh? What does it take to make you move, be motivated? What does it take to make you quit? And all kinds of temptations come into their life. They're not all things like, you know, some sexual thing or some, a lot of them are 
pressures that come into your life and things that, like Job went through without having an answer to them. God is really good at that. If you look at the life of the Lord Jesus, when the devil tempted him, he brought those three basic temptations of all of our life to the Lord. He used them on <clears throat> Eve and they worked and he's been using it on us ever since. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. And so we, we, we fall to those things and the Lord did not. He came out victorious over all those temptations that, that the devil brought to him. He never changes his tactic, but he offers us different things. And you say, well, preacher, you know, <clears throat> well, there's some things that I've just never been tempted to do. Well, I probably not. And this is my favorite. And I came up with it myself. And so, OK, I have a copyright on this. If <clears throat> if I told you that I had a, a one of the old 747s sitting out on a runway at DFW and it was yours If you could fly it off, fly around and come back and land it. You could do it. Well, most people are like that guy on that TV commercial. They go, I watch all this stuff on TV. Which way is the cockpit? You know, all right. Okay. Could you do that? Well, no. You know, very few people are qualified to, to be a jet passenger plane pilot. And well, there's a difference between flying a small plane and a giant 747, okay? And so, um, can I tell you that this, here we go. Ha, so, I bet none of you have ever been tempted to go steal a 747. And the devil comes and said, Hey, follow me, I'll let you steal this 747. You go, Yeah, I don't think so. How about just a car? <laughs> the devil's not stupid. He's not going to tempt things out of what where were you at? What what kind of desire? Let's go back to the James in the first chapter, and he said that lust has to be on the inside. What is it you want? What is it that you want? Lust is the ability to want something bad enough you'll get God up for it. Okay. There's different than wanting or desiring. It's what you'll trade God for. Well, the Lord could be tempted in every way without sin because he had no lust on the inside. Big difference, okay? Me, on the other hand, I, I had a guy tell him the other day, and he was on my case, and I said, tell you part of what I told him. He said, you know, are you going to give up motorcycle riding? Everybody I know that's on a motorcycle has had a wreck. I said, everybody I know that drives a car has had a wreck because they're running into motorcycle people. He said, well, you're not going to ever ride a bike again, are you? So, well, you know, if God gives it to me, I can't tell God no. Whatever the will of God is, you know what I mean? All right. And so you, you, you say, what, what, preacher, what that is? What is it? Can I tell you this? We all have something. And being able to control that something is what is our basic cause of, as a Christian is. So when we're enduring temptation, we're just taking that which is natural for us to do. I don't know about you guys, but I never desired to be a mountain climber. I'm not scared of heights. But I just never wanted to go, I'm going to learn to climb a mountain and go upside down and go over a big rock. And see, I, I never done that. Other people spend thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay, they have different desires. Whatever, what is it you want? What is it you want to be? You want to be in charge of something? You want to be able to tell everybody in the whole world what to do? I don't. I, I wouldn't want to be president of the United States if everybody, I got a 100% vote. I'd say I'd be like Lyndon Johnson the last time. I'm, I'm not going to take it if you vote me. And he said, I'm not going to run and I won't take it if you give it to me. Okay. And so I, I don't want that. I don't want to be a dictator over a country. Anybody ever woke up in the night going, I want to be a dictator? Me neither. We all got other stuff. Yeah, I promise you, you got enough stuff on the inside to deal with. You say, well, thank God, you know, you've never caught me trying to take over a country. No, we won't. But you're just as much a sinner as all the rest of us are. So we you have to endure temptation. And the, the scripture says that there's none without temptation. The devil would tempt Jesus. Why would he not tempt you? But I want you to look at the verse where we move forward from last week. It says, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest you fall. I can handle this. 
There are no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Everybody goes through it. But God is faithful. I don't care how many times you fail. You, you'll be right there. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. And I want you to get this. Every time you fail, it's your fault. Because the promise is that will, with the temptation, make a way for you to escape that you may be able to bear it. You will never have to be able to point your finger at God and say, well, he just let me out there all by myself. No, he didn't. You just told God, yeah, I'm going to try it one more time. See how it happens. Amen. And it went your way. There's always a way out. He'll make you a way out. Now, let's look at number two. We start in that, and that's James chapter two, verse number 18. It said, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be kind of first fruits of his creatures. That's because we're a new creation. The first time I read in the book of Psalms, when the scripture said that they would be new men created from the book of Psalms, that just blew my mind away that God was going to, because he finished the original creation right in Genesis. And nothing else has been created. He's going to create something else. Well, he did. Us. There was nobody. For in, if any man be in Christ, he is a half of the new Bible say creation. Because there wasn't anything like us until Jesus came into the world, died for our sins, rose again, gave us a, all of his grace and glory. And we have the ability to have the Holy Spirit on the inside sealing us. We're a brand new creature living in the world. Never existed before the time of Christ. The Spirit would come and go on people, but you got something every Old Testament saint never even thought about having. And the scripture said that of his own will he did that. He begat us. That word means to like bringing in the new birth. He begat us. Remember Abraham begat and Isaac begat. And, okay. And the Lord begat with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore we, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And then I want you to think about this. The disciple practices his faith. He practices his faith. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, a doctor practices medicine. A lawyer practices law. You know, goes through that. I've always said, you know, if I was an automobile mechanic and said, I tell you what, bring it to me and I'll practice on it. You'd say, no, I'll find somebody that knows what they're doing. But for some reason, those guys have practices. They're a little scary, isn't it, right? But in what we have. Paul told us, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I'm still stuck with this old body. You guys got in that? I'm stuck with this thing. I'm dragging it around. And I have to endure that temptation constantly. But I also have to find some way to understand. And I say this quite a bit because I want you to think about it. I know people that say, well, I'm not going to try to do anything for the Lord because I can never be perfect. When I get to be perfect, I'm going to serve God. Well, you'll be perfect as soon as God takes you out of this world, okay? But not till then. You get that? When we stand before the Lord, we'll stand there in holy and righteous without one blemish or one flaw. And then someday we'll get a new body made without hands, eternal in the heavens, and it'll be as perfect as God made us in our spiritual. He'll have no lust in it and any of those things. That'll, it's going to be a great time, isn't it? Right. I'm excited. Right now, though, he said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate. Think about the word, the grace of God. Did God make a mistake by telling us that we're saved forever, we're, we're his, we're secure in Christ? Or is that the means we get not only to come into Christ, but the means to be able to serve Christ in the world? The grace of God. Don't you think that, how many people do you think when the apostle Paul got saved, and, but when he was known as Saul and the killer of all the, you know, when he said, it's been told that the same guy that was persecuting is now preaching. What a difference it made. I bet it took a long time for anybody who trusted him. I know he spent about seven years back in his hometown before he got Barnabas came and got him and took him down. And we know his ministry started at Antioch. 
So it was a long, trying, hard time. I bet he won a lot of folks. If you look through the scripture and you, you pay attention to what you're reading, you'll notice that he won his brothers and sisters and his mom and other folks, and he mentions them through the New Testament. Now, he said, I do not frustrate the grace. If righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. You know how I practice my faith, number one? The number one way I practice my faith is I live it. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll be glad to tell you about Jesus. Okay, okay well, show me what he's done for you. We're going to get into that in just a little bit. When James says, you show me your faith without works, I'll show you my faith by my works. Brother Edmondson he used to be famous for saying, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. They come, they hook together. You can give out of guilt, you can give out of pressure, you can give out of some sales pitch, but if you love, you give. And so when you, when you love the Lord and you became a true disciple of the Lord, you will follow him and you're the first person that you reach is going to be you. Why would I believe what you say if you haven't persuaded yourself? If this God of yours is so good, you're a new creature in Christ, how come you cuss like a sailor and drink like a sailor? You no, know, so sailors are bad people. You ever know that? <laughs> so I, ever, I tell my son that he's a 20 year guy himself. So, you know, can I tell you that? I don't know why we say that. And for all of you guys who have ever been in the army camp, <clears throat> they do pretty good themselves. Amen. And so I, uh, they, they cuss so much guys. It's not real. I, back in the day, I get, I don't know if they do now or not as bad, but. I remember Brother Castro, I talked to him this week, and most of you know him, telling him, you know, he got mad because his dad kept telling him what to do, so he ran off and joined the Marines. Amen. And said he got off the boot camp, at, yeah, got off the bus at the Camp Lejeune for boot camp. He said the, the DIs, the, DI, the, the Marine guys were really neat guys. They, they had a different way of looking at things. And, uh, he said the DI was just screaming and hollering and cussing. And he said it was, said he raised his hand. He said, the DI said, what? He goes, are you angry about something? <laughs> the answer to that would be, I am now. <laughs> Amen. All right, but don't tell me that you're going to tell other people get their mouth under control when you can't keep yours under control. You get their heart under control when you can't keep yours under control. And he's telling you that well, I'm crucified with Christ. If it's true, then it's got to work in me first. You practice your faith because it works in your life. It works in your life. I, there's a whole bunch of things in life that are hard. I don't know about you. I am not a salesman. Never have been a salesman. God called me to preach. I'm one of those guys, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to show what the scripture says. I'm going to love you and care about you, but I'm not giving you a sales pitch. This is it. You trust Christ as your Savior, and God will change your heart and your life, and he'll make what you thought was the most miserable thing into something really good. You say, well, how do you know that? Because I'm his number one example. He did it with me. It would surprise me. Things would, that would come out of my mouth or not come out of my mouth after I got saved. What, my, what bothered me and what did, didn't bother me after I was saved. And sometimes I would say things, and you know, I had this bad habit that teenagers get into. I wasn't a teenager, but they'd get into it. And that's saying, huh? They heard you. They just didn't want to do it. Huh? Huh? Look at them out there. They're all out there now going, Ugh. we didn't know you knew that, you know? Huh? And you know what? I remember when the Holy Spirit said, quit that. Nobody in the room heard it, but I did. That is so disrespectful. And you can't be my disciple if you're disrespectful of people. I'm serious, guys. It was almost like you could hear it. And I can tell you where I was and when it was he told me to quit that. You can't be my disciple. Therefore, endured hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Why, why would I expect somebody else to be able to do what I don't first do first? 
That, that was terrible, wasn't it? What I want to first do first? What? I don't get a script here, guys. I'm preaching from a little deal, okay? <laughs> Why would I expect somebody else to do what I don't do? I ought to be the first example. Well, listen, to Tardis. How many of you guys? I, I had a great mom and dad. They were lost when I got saved, and they got saved later on, and my dad became one of the greatest soul winners I've ever known in my life. But it bothered them when I started being really faithful in church. There was a real quandary in my life about, and I, and I actually sat them down and asked them, I said, can you not understand, I've, I've not been the kid that you always wanted, but I want to be right now. But I can't leave God out of my life. And he said, I'm supposed to be in church. And their whole demeanor changed. Said, I don't want to be disrespectful or disobedient. Now, I was a young man, grown man, out of back home and nowhere near a kid. But I kind of tell you that that's what a disciple does. He endures hardness like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He endures hardness. It, it amazes me sometimes what people tell me when they're, they're in the military. Do you know what they're doing now in the military? Like we got people in the room right now. They have folks in the military. They're stopping boot camp so they can come home for Christmas vacation. Every, everybody in the room that's in the military, their eyes just went like, what? They didn't stop boot camp if it was 140 degrees. They didn't stop boot camp. It was 40 below zero either. I've been in both ends of it and watched it. Okay, it's not there. They're, they're going to let them all come in and take the break and go back to boot camp after the... Yeah, yeah that's right. Here's a couple right here in the front. Got a grandson. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, what? I guess so. I don't know. Good bird. <laughs> I wasn't making enough to make any money any. I didn't make any difference, so here you go. But, but come on, okay, it's different. They go, you know, I didn't know I was going to have to march in the army. I didn't know I was going to have to do this. and this. I didn't know I had to go over. I didn't realize we are going to, just because we joined the Marine Corps, I was going to have to fight somewhere. You know, I didn't realize that my life would be in danger. What did you think you were doing? This wasn't a Boy Scout trip. One of the reasons I love the military today, guys, is because everybody we got, is a volunteer. Nobody's conscripted in there. And I'm not against conscription. I'll just tell you up front. But nobody is. They're all volunteers. They're there because they want to be there. Isn't that special? We have the greatest military in the whole world. Even if they do get to go home for Christmas, you know. Endure hardness is a good soldier. This is true. If a man desires the office of a bishop, now I'm picking on preachers. You're watching me? Here I am. You want to be a preacher? You said uh, he must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Why well, God would want two wives, I don't know. Okay. I'm having a hard time obeying the one I got. All right. I'm sorry. Yeah, I told her a long time ago it would help dear my sermons if you said amen instead of uh. You know, so. <laughs> It would help, okay? It would help my preaching a little bit. So, The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober. Now that, that, that's really not, not being not drunk or high. That's the ability to have all of your being cognizant to everything that's going on around you and what you're experiencing and how to deal with it. Of good behavior. Of good behavior. You're given to hospitality. If you don't like people, stay out of the ministry. Just stay out of it altogether. Two-thirds of the whole ministry you have is caring about people. Two-thirds of the ones that you care about don't care if you care or not. But you still have to care. That's part of what we do. Apt to teach. Heck, don't get around me. Hey, ask my teenagers. Ask my, my, my grandkids. Papa never quits teaching, does he? Never quits teaching. He's always going to teach you something. Oh, you know, that's a good... I, let me show you this. 
And so it's okay. It's all right. I got I got the only teenage girls in the whole church that can back a 22 foot trailer around the curve. Okay, with with my big truck. So, but they do get to okay. But I'm always teaching them some. Hey, let's do this. Teach me some. Work on this. You know, get this. We're gonna learn how to do it. Teach. Learn to teach. Not given to wine. No striker. Not greedy. A filthy lucre. That means you know allowing to be bought. I've never had that problem as a pastor in many of my churches I ran. But patient, not a brawler, not a brawler. I, I know it's you can lose your temper. So I'm listen. Now I'm talking about preachers. So listen, you ought to be able to say amen to most of this stuff. <clears throat> Don't always believe everybody in the world is out to get you. That's what causes most of those things. Not a brawler. Not willing just to fight at the drop of a hat. My dad used to say to my brother, that you not only want to fight at the drop of a hat, you carry the hat around. <laughs> not covetous. I, I want to promise you when I die, and you look over my record of giving in our church, and you'll find that there probably is not very many people in here that even met it, much less surpassed it. Generous. Generous. Thank God for all the wonderful things. Everybody treated us so wonderful at our anniversary stuff. And I'm going to just be honest with you, it was the greatest anniversary gifts and stuff we've ever gotten. And they just get better and better and you outdo yourself every year. But to be generous. Can't love without giving. You remember that. One that rules well his own house. You know, I'm working on that, okay? All right. I'm like Brother Edmondson now. He said he was the head of his household, that, but his wife was the neck. You know? <laughs> Have his children in the subject with all gravity. Nobody's perfect. Look at verse 5. If a man know not how to rule his own house, how should he take care of the church of God? If, if you know anybody that has perfect kids, let me know. We'll talk about it later. I'll probably tell you they're not telling you the truth. But here's here. Not a novice. What's a novice? They're new at it. They're just learning, right? Hey, man. There's nothing worse than somebody who is on a diet and lost weight or somebody that's been smoking and they quit smoking. They're on everybody's case. Have you ever, have y'all ever noticed that? You know, you're looking a little fat there. If you're doing like me, you could be able to. Well, I got a Bible where it says the righteous of the Lord should be made fat. There you go. See there? All right. Or the smokers. God bless them that they quit. God bless them. But you know, what I want to know, you know, Will Rogers said, quitting smoking is easy. He said, I've done it 40 times. See, I want to know. I want to see what you got in your life. The novice just keeps going back and keeps going. And, and something that's proved a point. Less being lifted up in pride, he fall in the condemnation of the devil. And that's what happens to pastors who are not ready to pastor. They're just, they just have enough to run the testimony of that in the church they're at. Moreover, we must have a good report of them which are without. Now, I, I want you to get something, guys. I got a lot of lost friends. I have a lot of lost You just got people that are lost? Is your friends? Yeah. They have to listen to me talk about Jesus all the time. We were just before church talking about when I lived in East Fort Worth and over here. I, I was the chaplain in a couple of the motorcycle gangs that ran in Fort Worth. We all did. We we were downtown buying one of my youth uh, associate pastors a pair of boots at the old boot place downtown, and we're all on our box. Brother Bob was there, you know what I'm talking about. And we pull up, and here pulls up a whole bunch of them around us in a circle, you know. And it's, everybody's going, "We're dead," you know. <laughs> the guy gets off, and he goes, "Hey, preacher," said, "Hey, possum, what's happening?" And you could, it was like. <laughs> You know these guys? Yeah, they know them all. He said, you know, you're in a bad part of town. I said, well, yeah. Did y'all go in there? I said, we're going to buy us boots for this associate guy. He said, go on in. We'll watch your box. They'll be okay. And guess what? Nobody bothered them. The whole time we were gone. Nobody bothered them. I did their funerals. I won some of them to the Lord. Some of them 
you know, that, that I'd buried in one of their families. And I'm telling you guys, okay. But having a good report of them who are without, lest you fall under the reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. You wouldn't tolerate a pastor who didn't have most of those traits. But most church people say, well, that's for him to be, but not me. You heard about the preacher, didn't you? Took a church first Sunday, didn't show up for Sunday school, and second Sunday came in, he wasn't prepared to preach, and third Sunday, it, it, he just had some kind of, they finally got him and said, look, you know what, we, you can't do that. He said, the last thing we need is a preacher that acts like the members. You know? <laughs> Peter said, and let the elders among you, who I'm also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, a partaker of the glory that's to be revealed, feed the flock which is among you, taking oversight thereof, but not by constraint, but willingly. Now, when I got saved, I was raised in a part of the country that spoke old English with a southern drawl. I'm telling you, I, could, I can pick them out. Jocelyn was traveling with a college group one time. One of them showed up here, and I thought, I can tell you with 100 miles where, you're, where you grew up, from what you said. Because they go to the Duck Daughter, and they drive around on tractors, and they had Hereford cattle there. I know, I'm telling you what I'm talking about, okay? So when I got saved, and I saw a lot of the Bible words that you have problems with, I never had any problems with them. The word froward. The word froward. You know how many times I heard my dad say, we got to get rid of that bay because she's froward. You know what it means? They want to do what they want and not what you want. Froward. See, and the Bible says you can be froward with God. Go back and look up the word. And you'll find it say those things over and over. We're, we're supposed to have a this attitude, you see, that I, you can't force people to, to love you. You can't force people to be the subjection to you. And you can't do that. You're, you're just church. You're a volunteer. Unless I heard a lady say one time she was on drugs. And she, I said, what? And she said, yeah, my mom drugged me to church. She drugged me to Sunday school. She drugged me to school, you know. Yeah. All of her life. But listen to me. Even God can't force you to love him. He can command you that you're supposed to, but he can't force you to do it. If he did, number one, he'd cease being God. And number two, it wouldn't be love. I don't know who you are, but if you know, if you pointed 44 in my face, I'd be like... Um, one of the old movies I used to watch, and one of the great guys, remember him, and starred in the, uh, like the, <clears throat> well, I ain't mentioned his name, but I liked him in his movies, real gangster kind of guy. And, and this guy was, they came out and got him and brought him in to stand before a, um, somebody that was going to kill him. And, and, he, and the guy goes, Thank you for showing up today. And I remember he, he said, It's not, it's, not very hard to take an invitation that's written on the end of a 45. In a minute, you'll know what I'm talking about, right? And you say, well, tell me you like me. Well, I'll say, well, I like you. Maybe even give you my money. Can I have your money? Yeah, you got. You get $12. Here it is. Whatever much I got in my wallet. See, nobody can force you to give. We can't force you to love. We can't force you to follow. If you're going to be a disciple of the Lord, you got to practice your discipleship. You got to practice your faith. And you love the Lord, not because you have to, because you want to. And that's what Peter's saying. I don't have to corral everybody. And I am not much of a, I don't, I don't, I don't like pressure. I don't like pressure. I don't like sales pressure. I don't like people pressuring you into anything. You know, I don't want to do that to people. God didn't do that to me. 
He didn't get me to cross with saying, you don't get straightened up, boy. You're, you know, I'm just going to. He just said, there's hell out there. You're going. But I got a way you don't have to. And I chose that of my own free will. Not coerced into it, not pushed into it, not in any way other than my choice. If you want to be a disciple, you do that by practicing your faith. And when you do that, look at the verse, guys. What happens? You know what's wrong with American Christianity? We're not practicing our faith. We have faith. We're just not practicing it because we did. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Praise your name as being a good guy. No. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, that's my job. That's what a disciple does, remember? They're not just a believer. They're not just a follower. There's somebody that's out there practicing it and drawing people in. They're going to do it. And so we'll look at, wherefore the Lord said, for as much as people draw them down me with their mouth, but with their lips they do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. That's not what we want. We want people's hearts are drawn close to God. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. When you practice your faith, it shows. When you practice your faith, it shows out to the world. And so we're talking about being a disciple of the Lord. I, I want to be known as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to do everything in my power to prove to you and the rest of the world that he's real in my life and that he's worth you trusting. And I'm going to say that again tonight. He's worth you trusting. You say, well, you know, I, don't, I don't want to quit being me. I, I don't know that the Lord has any perfect form for Christian people. The only standard I know it says that we be conformed to the image of Christ. Not mine, not this church's, not somebody else's, not your grandmother's, not your father's, not the people you work at, but Christ. So here's the end question. Are you a disciple of the Lord? How conformed are you in your faith to the image of Christ? That's a good measure, ain't it? It's a great measure. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless and thank you, Lord, for what you've done in our lives. I'm like the Apostle Paul. Lord, I've done a lot of stuff and worked in a lot of things and love you, but nowhere near perfect. And Lord, I haven't arrived. I'm not even sure sometimes that I've made it to the top of the hill yet. But I know this, as long as I live and breathe, I want to honor your name, proclaim to the world your love to us and to them, and Lord, preach Jesus and the salvation that he brings into a person's life, the joy that comes with it, and the treasure we have in the world that we would not have without him. I'm thinking there's people, Lord, all over, people listening to this and people who will listen to it, that, Lord, are looking for something in their life, and they've tried everything but this. And I ask you, Lord, to deal with their hearts, and I ask you, Father, to help them to know that I'm sorry, somebody that's supposed to have been a Christian wasn't what they want you to be, but they're blaming God for what somebody else did. And I'm asking you to help them to see Jesus. And if any way I can show it to them, I want to do that. I want to be his disciple. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand up with me, please. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Just
Mike Kenny, would you lead us in closing prayer, please? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the time to come to your house. Lord, help us to be disciples, not just followers, but disciples. Lord, to show others what our faith is and the love that you have for us to them. Lord, we just praise you for all that you do for us. Thank you for answer prayers. Be with those that are on our prayer list and need your hand. Lord, we just watch over them, bring them back. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.